PhD update. I'm going to try and do like every couple of weeks an update of what I've done. Um, just like a video diary of how I'm feeling and a rating. So this is for the period of the 1st of February 2022 to Friday the 18th of February 2022. Um, these couple of weeks have been really good because I've actually been enrolled and I've started my PhD so that has been like three years in the making. I attended PhD induction, um, I got a lot of things organised like um, knowing where to start for my PhD so like there's no courses or anything so it's like where do I start? <laughs> there's so many places to start but um, I'm starting with my literature review and I created a mind map of what I want the reader to understand about my research before diving in. So the literature review is like um, for me to read about what information is out there already and present it to the reader but also highlight and analyse the lack of information that is not out there and how my research is going to fit into that. So I've actually been really excited reading um, papers about like the Samoan tr traditional knowledge and um, understanding how like for instance I was just reading today that um, in terms of the archaeological evidence they found rings of stones and so previously um, they only used the breadfruit tree as an example but they would put um, mounds of stones around the tree and um, they said that was to protect the tree from animals so I'm assuming like when it's first starting to grow they don't want animals to come along and eat all the leaves um, and it's to help with um, temperature control as well so I'm guessing that when um, there may be like a cold burst or something the stones retain the heat so they actually put the heat into the ground and also um, Oh, there was another reason I can't remember, but for me, knowing, reading about that, that's really cool knowledge. Um, how does it relate to my <laughs> PhD? Well, I guess that is archaeological evidence of um, cultivation of trees. And it's so interesting because the things that I've read about so far are all about cultivation of trees and crops. I haven't read anything about meat, in terms of meat consumption, um, like pre-colonization and so the archaeological evidence of the stone of the stone circles they said were of like the past 3,000 years like back 3,000 years so for me that was like that's pretty cool I'm pretty sure that's pre-colonization <laughs> um so that's really cool to read um I also read about like food storage as well and so I learned about food storage when I attended um, the breadfruit conference in Samoa when I was working there because someone, I can't remember who it was, but they talked about bread fermentation and it just blew in my mind because I had no idea that was something that people did. And so there's a lot in the research about breadfruit ferm fermentation being present in like the Marquesas, Marquesan states, um, Samoa, Cook Islands and Fiji as well. So that was quite a common way of preserving um, breadfruit. Um, I also read that, um, it's quite interesting, like European, um, there were re like European accounts of um, things that they've seen in the Pacific Islands and one of them noted that the food was quite bland and starchy in the islands. But back then, for Pacific peoples who were originally eating lots of starchy foods and had no introduction to citrus type of fruits and that type of flavour, for them the fermentation was quite different because it gives like a kind of like a, I guess like a soury citrusy taste. So for, for us in the Pacific Islands back then, that was quite, quite exciting. That wasn't bland for us. Um, and I've noticed that there is just like, I've only read about five papers, but I've noticed that it's really hard to locate exactly what Samoan traditional foods are, especially pre-colonization. And there's like, um, I think it's hard because the way that I'm looking at it is within a, I guess, I don't even know, but like a scientific sense. But what I'm finding is that a lot of the knowledge is through anthropology and um, um, there's a word anthropology and 
is it ethnographic ethno ethnoarchological stuff so i think i have to shift the way that i am searching the for um papers through the databases so shifting it to um look at the archaeological site and so that reminded me an email of Julie, Dr. Julie Spray, Dr. Julie Spray that she sent me and she put me in contact with Jessica Harden who is Assistant Professor of Anthropology um, in Rochester Institute of Technology in Arizona and so she recommends some really good people who have been doing a lot of um, stuff in this area but not specifically in Samoa and so she suggested some people in their names but she said I wish I had more Samoan authors on the list um, and certainly many of McCarvey and Hawley's collaborators are Samoan but there aren't actually any Samoans doing this work so it's like what the fuck <laughs> um, and so maybe that was some and so I was thinking like because there is a lack of information there could be a paper out of that by um, doing a I forgot the word but it's like a paper review we can produce a paper by um, analyzing other papers and I did some of that in my qualitative paper um, so I thought that might be an opportunity to do something like that um, in addition to my literature review so that I can produce a paper saying that there is a lack of traditional knowledge being published how are we expect to I don't know because then there's many conversations around that like well it shouldn't be published it should be kept with Samoan people for Samoan people but on the hand, other hand it's like well a lot of the government's decision making is um, dictated by research so it's quite interesting because like there's a lot of examples from Fiji I've seen they've done some work in like um, Fiji um, oh, not Kiribati but it's like other places except for Samoa um, and my other thought I wrote it down as well it's like uh, I was thinking what do you call it like um, when I'm reading about things and thinking about traditional food pre-colonization I also have to understand was Western Samoa and American Samoa not separated at the time so I think it would be good to do some historical knowledge and research around that because in my mind I'm only thinking of Samoa as Western Samoa but by looking at the islands as like one two three four maybe four of them that's quite dispersed out so then that could give me more of an understanding of why they were planting eating certain foods in certain places and I'm sure like some of the like for instance in Tutuila so American Samoa, it is so freaking steep there. Like you couldn't grow crops there. It's like it's even just hard enough for people to live there. Because I remember when we went there for um, a va'a tournament in American Samoa. Like when when you drive on the main road, it's pretty much the main road, the ocean, and then the, the, like mountains go like straight up, and no one's gonna live out there. You can't grow anything up there. So. Um, the islands are actually quite different compared to Western Samoa and American Samoa, so that would also, I'm guessing, influence what they're going to eat at those certain places. Um, some things that I found difficult. Um, yeah, I found difficult like looking for. Where is it? Um just looking for papers that specifically looking at Samoan traditional foods um pre-colonization so I've been meaning to email Judy McFall to see what databases that I can look at um there are some um books that are available in the library that I will need to get but I want to make a collection before making a special trip in um Oh, what else? I want to see, talk about what else I have read because I think that'll be helpful as well. Um, oh, yeah, there was this one article that I read from Carson. 
it was quite interesting because yeah like so the the first settlers in Samoa they presumed that they had adopted a lot of their um, cultivation practices and kind of landscapes from Easter Island and so he described it that they came and domesticated the landscape by creating it similar to what they used to in Easter Island in addition to that they bought in 49 plants they were introduced to Samoa so I was saying that the original settlers that came to Samoa had also introduced 49 plants into Samoa and that would have happened during the time of migration that were coming over and I, that surprised me because I, I thought a lot of the species were uh, how do you say it like native endemic to Samoa so they had been there for a long time but I'm guessing you know they had to come from somewhere um, and for me it kind of felt like these people had really so in terms of Easter Island, from my understanding is that a lot of the sources had been depleted and so people had to go elsewhere. And so it must have been like they really missed home and so they wanted to bring home with them and part of that was bringing food. And so my thought would be how were they able to bring those plants over in the va'a and how did they know how to make sure that they were safe during that journey? Like how do they know that they may have like do they bring seed form or in terms of like a tipula like a stem or like how do they know to make those decisions obviously now today we would know that seeds are the best way to go but we you were at sea for so long traveling you need to protect them somehow so how do they protect the seeds and so for me all of that process and experimentation is all science and so for me that's all traditional knowledge and understanding those processes to bring those those plants to Samoa the other thing I wanted to note is that within those plants galo was part of that um, and there were a lot of medicinal plants but I also have to check to check if there were any foods because I hadn't um, because I hadn't um, looked through that They talked a lot about, um, oh yeah, so irrigation channels because this, this paper was about, yeah, the archaeological perspective of cultivation practices. So they um, talked about that there were no irrigation channels compared to those in Hawaii, but in Samoa, um, I guess people didn't adapt uh, pe farmers were able to adapt to grow galo inland so again like making a decision like that saying oh um we're used to planting this way but there's nothing here on this land we're going to try this and plant it inland but they also noted that there were galo grown in naturally wetland areas and so all of that archaeological perspective I wonder if I have to write about that in a like particular style as well um because that is like a different topic altogether <gasps> so I have to find that out um another paper by Pollock so apparently Nancy Pollock has written a lot of work um, about this so I'm um, slowly going through the papers which is really helpful but again like nothing specifically Samoan um, uh, in this paper on food storage among hunter gatherers she talked about how it was I think it's critiquing another paper but um, what I learned is that when societies are coming to a different area or they're introduced to new foods they need to understand um, what is going to um, give them energy what is edible and so um, for instance the taste of foods was really important so for pacific um, communities for instance the gal or if it's eaten raw you know it's going to be really itchy around the mouth so they had to really experiment with what ways is going to make this edible so I don't even know if there like was a version of the umu back then or even like boiling of galo back then I really don't know but doing that is a form of traditional science as well um 
I was going to say something. Oh, yeah. So palatability and um, having a starchy diet also remind me of the work that I did with in the summer, which is about amylase. So amylase is, um, is an enzyme that is in the saliva, salivary glands and I think in the stomach as well and helps to break down starchy foods. So um, if someone has a high rich diet, um, and if we're saying I just heard someone shouting I like the farmer and if we're if that community is having a high starch diet then you can presume that they're going to have a lot of amylase in their system because they're eating lots of starch and they need to break it down into sugars and so that reminded me that you can kind of connect the dots in that way where the archaeological evidence is there and then we're having the the MLAs, uh, the scientific way. So I guess that's an example of how the two would combine that we're having this archaeological evidence, this traditional knowledge, and then this making that connection with the amylase enzyme that we're looking at the scientific aspect as to how we know it has come about. Hmm. I just thought of that now. So um, overall, the first couple of weeks have been good. Um, I feel confident in what I'm doing. Um, um, my aim is to read more papers in the next week, read a lot more and actually write a paragraph down. So yeah, that's my PhD update and yeah. This is the video diary for my... <laughs> That's my dog chasing the kid, the uh, chickens. Panati! No! Very naughty. So this is the video diary of my fourth week of my PhD. Um, this week I completed training needs analysis, which is online. So that was part of the checklists of a part of PhD where I, um, Tra like fill in the skills that I think um sorry I have like a list of skills and then I put what number I think I'm at it's so like one being like quite not developed at all to five to quite well developed and so I think it's a way of um giving the meaning behind why a PhD is in the university way so anyway, done that. Um, I did an FX module online, which is where I just searched that on the university website and they have quite a detailed um, explanation of how to fill out ethics forms. So that was really helpful because it went into detail of how to actually fill out the application. That's one of the things I've been really concerned about because when you do research that involves um, animals or people, you have to have um, ethics approval. So that means that you're doing the research that is... Um, respectful to that person or to the animal in an appropriate way and so that that your application goes through many um committees to see if that is um a proper way and safe way and respectful way to carry out your research so that gave me more confidence doing that um i messaged my supervisors about um that more examples of the ethics application and also like examples of um literature reviews and thesis proposals and one of them said that I should just look at um, past PhD thesis for literature review examples. I read um, some more um, papers around Samoan traditional food. Um, at the moment I feel like I want to read more of that section so that I can write something out of that um, but I am feeling very behind in my reading. Um, why Maybe because I had like one whole day where I worked for filming this week. So I'm like, oh my gosh, I missed a whole day. Um, and I feel like when I'm looking for papers, I'll find the title looks good and then I'll read it and be like, no, that 
doesn't that's not what I'm looking for so I feel like I'm doing a lot of that at the moment and then when I find a paper then it's kind of like um so I do like a Pomodoro technique and like every 25 minutes you have uh, you work and so by the end of the 25 minutes I find a paper and I'm like okay well I have to come back to that tomorrow or something um but that is one of my goals for next week is to read more papers around that and hopefully write something around that and I also made a note in my own personal updates that by ne that next week I should create like more of a plan of when I want to have a draft of my literature review and when I want to have a draft of my thesis proposal so it gives me a date to work to because at the moment I'm like I, need, I know I need to have this done by the end of the year so I'm just like Meh. so I need some urgency around that and I think I'll feel more comfortable doing it like that um I also requested some books from the University of Auckland Library um there's some um, like um I don't know what we call it but they're like um western people's accounts of their endeavors in in the pacific so this is quite early on when um colonization or even pre-colonization um sorry colonization would have been happening so um i'm really looking forward to reading those <coughs> as well um there's also one thing that I really need to do on my milestone list, and that's in terms of um, connecting relationships um, with Samoan communities. So I really need to work on that next week. But overall, I'm feeling a bit like behind. I'm feeling like I need to do more reading. And I'm feeling like I should email my supervisors more because I haven't heard back from them. So um Next week, I'm going to try and annoy my supervisors and make sure that they're here and that make, making sure, I guess, that I get what I need from them and that I'm actually getting the support that I need because they don't know what I need if I don't tell them. So, yeah, that's the plan. Um, yeah. Today is Wednesday, the 2nd of um March or Matsi in Samoan 2022. Uh, this is going to be a monthly update video diary thing um, during my PhD. So I have officially completed one month since I started my PhD. So that's I've completed February, February 2022, the month of February 2022. Um, in terms of like world stuff that's going on, like COVID is still really bad in New Zealand. Um, like we've been getting 14,000 cases daily um, and the new variant Omicron um, is just spreading rapidly. So I'm pretty much just staying at home. A lot of university stuff is at home um, because it's just not worth going out and putting Nana at risk because at the moment 90 years old. Um, so today I've just been staying at home. I've stayed at home all of today which is rare so that's really good. I've got a lot of work done. Um, as I just finished um, one of my jobs, um, I did some work for... Um, the University of Auckland Pacific and Science website. So I was um, creating Pacific profiles of students um, doing some language stuff with them. I'm also ending one of my other contracts today with AUT, so creating Pacific and Science projects, which has been challenging. And then in a couple of months time, I'll be ending my um, other contract with um, looking at some asthma research with kids. So it's been pretty busy, um, but in terms of PhD this month, um, it's been really underwhelming because it took so long, it took three years for me to get into the PhD program and so much shit to go through. Um, oh, this top, like, I don't know. <laughs> My partner got it. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, it, the PhD, getting in and like starting it is really underwhelming because it's like, no congratulations or thing. it's just like you're in the PhD program and so here's all the things that you need to do and like there's a checklist that you need to achieve in your first year and it's like okay chill like we just got in here and we're gonna celebrate or anything and it's like nah so you just go straight into it um 
I did like my induction all online all that type of stuff and I guess generally like it feels overwhelming because there's so much stuff to do like I have to complete my literature review in the first year and then complete my thesis proposal and I think for me the most overwhelming thing is that there's like it's such a big task I don't even know where to start and I've done that like I know I've created a foundation but now it's like oh my gosh there's so much to read like where do I start again so I kind of been feeling like well I gotta start somewhere so I've just started reading and finding looking at example thesis and kind of putting in looking from looking at reading papers and then finding papers within that and then noting them down so this is what I've kind of been doing and I'm feeling behind because I feel like oh my gosh I'm not reading enough like I've only got I think it was like five journals noted down that I've written notes on um, and of those I haven't done like any annotations on the papers yet I just wrote into my Google Drive which is like the online drive to the online drive to save all my work so that um, if, if anything happens to my computer I've got it all online like on the cloud so yeah just like feeling like really underwhelming there's a lot to do um but i've also really enjoyed reading um especially some more traditional aspects um like so firstly i started with looking at salmon traditional food and um kind of looking at pre-colonization stuff and I went to the library yesterday because I had to order some books and I love books like I love like I love the texture and feel like and the smell like I'm a booky type of person and I got this book the Pacific Journal of Louis de Bougainville series 3 volume 9 from 19 from 1767 to 1768 I'm like blow my mind like what was happening in the 1700s? I was like, kings, nobles. It's like, just blows my mind. But anyway, he's, um, from like, I just briefly skim read it, but like, he's, um, is it what you call aristocrat? Like, he's quite well off, well educated, comes from, you know, a, a big family of intelligent people back then. So I imagine he was quite rich and influential, like Elon Musk vibes. And, um, he wanted to navigate the Pacific Ocean, which, like, in my mind, I'm like, there's such a big feat to do, um, to take a ship around the world into no unknown areas. I guess it's like kind of going into space and exploring space up there, not knowing what you might find. And so this contains his journal and also some other people's journal who were on that ship. And from what I'm gathering is other ships as well. And so they've recounted... Um, uh, what they've seen when they've gone through Samoa and Fiji and like Papua New Guinea and I read last night that um, so back then they classified the Samoa, Samoa as Samoan Islands and so that included Western Samoa and American Samoa and it sounded like that they were going past the Manua Islands which is part of American Samoa not the main island but this other island on the other side and they <laughs> They, he described that there, he could see canoes um, that held like eight men. He described them as savages, but in that sense, the word has a different meaning. So savage means more forest dwelling people, people that are less around civilizations, civilization. So I guess it's kind of like bush, like they looked more bush um, or like more rugged compared to um the tahitian people that he'd seen before samoa um he also described like some of the women I, he described a woman on the boat as um hideous but he said that their hair was black and tied up in different ways and that, that he saw one person with red hair so i wonder what that was and then he also described them as having like just a belt covering their private parts and then they actually had like paint like on them on their thighs and their bum so I'm not sure where that paint came from as well as like um it kind of described it like branching out necklace so 
for me that was really exciting to read because it's like I think that was dated May 1768 or 17 something like that and those are one of the early accounts of our ancestors and so for me it's just like <laughs> I love that type of reading because it blows my mind it's like man way back then like that's the closest image or like the closest document that we could get to um our people all the way back then and so in my mind I was kind of thinking oh, it'll be really cool to like draw draw that but like I mean would I'd have to have some sort of accuracy around like how the face looked and things like that because I'm sure it would have looked different but yeah I've been really enjoying that and I've got um I got so Nancy Pollock has done a lot of work in terms of Pacific food and like um ethno um anthropology stuff and so Dr. Julie Spray put me onto her. Um but this one is called These Roots Remain. I haven't looked at this one but um I'm keen to read about that. So I feel like that'd be really ideal. And then I got this one, History of the Pacific Islands, I C Campbell. I'm not sure why I saw this but I got like all of these book references from different papers and found that they could um I could only look at them either by buying the book or like an ebook or by getting it from the library so I'm like oh, fuck that <laughs> I'm gonna go to the library but I mean even though it took it take it would take me like it's pretty much like an 80 kilometer round trip to go and get the books but at least I don't have to pay for them so I'm looking forward to read these two books um, and then also doing some more reading. Um, so yeah, that's just the overview of my first month of PhD. So I've completed February 2022 and um, 